We just want to welcome every one of you back here to the Lay Institute for Evangelism. We're glad that those of you at home have decided to join us here in our classroom. We are going over our ninth Bible study in our series called Life on the Edge. This series, again, is designed to enable you not only to learn the Bible study, but also to learn how to give the Bible study. We'll go now to, uh, we'll get right into our Bible study. On the graphic there, you'll see that the title for our Bible study is The Second Coming. The Second Coming. You can see that the, on the screen there, you can see that the code to mark this Bible study is SC. The code is to mark it is SC. C. Just like all of the other Bible studies that we've gone over this far, this Bible study too has a purpose. And the purpose of this Bible study is to show that the second coming of Jesus is literal, visible, audible, and imminent. The second coming of Jesus is literal. It's going to happen. It's audible. You're going to be able to hear it. It's visible. You're going to be able to see it. It's imminent. It is is going to happen, and it is going to happen soon. You'll also see up there, as all of our other Bible studies, this too is centered on Jesus Christ. The center it for this, Jesus longs to come and take us home to live with Him forever. Jesus longs to come and take us home to live with Him forever. Before we jump into this Bible study, what are we going to do? We're going to pray. That's our habit, to pray. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege of us being here, of us being able to watch this program and learn, Lord, not from me, but from your word. We pray that as we go through this Bible study that you will open our hearts and our minds so that we can love your truth and thereby be saved. We pray this in, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now this Bible study is put together so that you can do it in two parts if you want to. So the first 12 references in this study will be the first part of this, the uh, second coming study. And then the last set of references will be the second part. So our goal during this hour is to go through the first part of this Bible study. At the end of this first part, you can, if there's no questions and people have no objections, you can then go to your next Bible study, which would be Bible study number 10, the Bible study that comes right after the second coming, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the millennium. So the first half of this, if there's no questions, people aren't confused whatsoever, you can say praise the Lord and then just go to the next, to go to study number 10. If there are questions, that's what the second half of the study is designed to answer. So the first half, we're going to be talking about the manner of Christ's return. Then in the second half, we're going to be talking about some of the confusing aspects of the, some of the second coming texts. There are some very wild theories out there that are not biblical, that people claim are biblical, but we're going to show the truth from God's Word. It is always better to start with the truth and then to deal with objections later because you want to lay that foundation that people can say, hey, well, this is what the Bible said. Now let me interpret what I thought through what the Bible has already taught me. And so that's what we're going to do in this series of studies. You see here the first 12 references on the screen are the first 12 references in the first half of this study. Then you'll see on the next screen, you'll see that there's another 12 references for that part of the second coming. The first part deals with the manner of Christ's return, what happens when Jesus returns. The second half, and what we will cover in our next program, will tell us about the uh, thief in the night concept. It will tell us about the left behind. One is taken, the other one is left. So we'll be talking very in-depth about that because we want to make sure that everyone is very clear about what Scripture does say concerning the second coming of Jesus. So we'll go now to our first text in this study. We're going to go to John 
chapter 14. John the 14th chapter. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 14. And we're going to let Shalita start this off for us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the 14th chapter, the first three verses. So if you could read that for us, Shalita. And I'm going to interrupt you. You know, that's quite common when I'm teaching. So I'll just interrupt you as you read. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, stop right there. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, Shalita, if Jesus is going to prepare a place for me, if Jesus is going to prepare a place for you, what do you suppose Jesus is going to do at some point in the future? He's going to do what? Come back. For what purpose? To take us where he's preparing. To take us where he's preparing a place for us. If he's preparing a place for us, it makes logical sense for us to even think, before we read verse 3, that Jesus is going to take us to that place. Go ahead and keep reading. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus gives us a promise that he's going to prepare a place for us. And then he says in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the promise here is that Jesus is going to come back and he is going to take us to heaven with him. Now, for the early church, we're going to look at a reference that shows that it was the hope of the second coming of Jesus that changed and transformed the hearts and purified the hearts of the early followers of Christ. So Jesus gives us a promise here in John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Then he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. And then he makes us a very solemn promise that he will return and that he will take us where he is preparing a place for us. My question is, Bill, are you ready to go where Jesus is preparing a place for you? No, oh, praise the Lord. Let's see what this hope, the hope of the second coming did for the early church. Let's go to our second reference. We're going to 1 John. We were in John. Now we're going all the way back near to the book of Revelation. So we're in 1 John. If you find Revelation, you'll back up just a little bit there. So here I'm in Revelation, and now I'm backing up past Jude, 3 John, 2 John. Here I am, 1 John, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. We're going to let Danielle read that for us. 1 John, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth, appear, doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay, stop right there. So John says here that when Jesus shall appear, now the event where Jesus appears, he appeared once, that was his first coming. The next time that Jesus is going to appear, the event is called the second coming of Jesus. Thus the title for this study, Second Coming. John says, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And when we get further into the study, we're going to find out that we are going to be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ at the second coming. So this, the, the concept here, or the time period that we're talking about, is the second coming of Jesus. So you want to keep reading there for us, Danielle. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Okay, so verse 2 said, We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope, what hope is that? The hope of the second coming, the hope of being just like Jesus. This, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is is pure. So every man that has the hope of the second coming in his heart 
is purifying himself for what purpose? To be ready when Jesus returns. To be ready when Jesus returns. So, the first text that we went to, John 14, 1 through 3, is where Jesus makes us a very solemn promise that he will come back. Now, when Jesus said, and when you're giving this Bible study, you can, you can bring out other aspects and other points as well. When Jesus said, let there be light, what happened? There was light. When Jesus said, let there be a firmament, what happened? There was a firmament. When Jesus speaks, things happen. So Jesus made the promise that he would come back. Do you know what that means? That he has to come back. Because if he doesn't come back, then what is Jesus? He's a liar and Jesus can't lie, can he? So Jesus makes the promise that he's going to come back. Then we went to John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, to show that the hope of being like Jesus, the hope that comes from Jesus actually going to, the hope that we have that Jesus is going to come back, is what purifies us. Think about it for a moment. If you knew for certain that Jesus was coming back this afternoon, would you live your life just a little bit different? Mm -hmm. Many of us would, wouldn't we? Why? We want to be ready. Because we aren't ready. That's why we would live a little bit differently, because we want to be ready, because we're not ready. So the hope of the second coming actually gives us a motivation for being ready for the second coming. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's why we went from John 14 over to 1 John chapter 3. Now we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to see that when Jesus comes, He comes without any reference to sin, but for the sole purpose of salvation. It is not at the second coming that Jesus deals with sin. That's going to come later, and you're going to find that out in our next program, the program on the, the topic of the millennium. So we're going now to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. You see that on your graphic, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, and we are going to ask Mike Mudd if he'll read this for us. Hebrews, of course, is just a little bit to the left from where we were. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So the first part of that verse tells us that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. So Christ came the first time for the purpose of doing what? Saving, Saving us from what? Sin. sin. He came the first time for the purpose of bearing our sin. Now we've got a class here that, uh, called the sanctuary. We're going to be going over the sanctuary and we're going to see how it is that Christ fulfilled that aspect of bearing our sins and then shedding His blood for us. So the first time Christ came, he came to bear the sin of many. Then it says, unto them that look for him shall he appear. What's that word? Appear. So it's not going to be anything that we can't what? See. That's right. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. What time? Second time. The second time without sin unto what? Salvation. Salvation. So when Jesus comes back the second time, He's coming back not to deal with sin, but to take those people off of this earth that have been saved by the sacrifice He gave the first time He was here. Do you see that? Is that clear from Scripture? Mm -hmm. All right. So now we go. What we're going to do is we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Not, not too much, but just a little bit. We're going to go to look at verses in Scripture that show that when Christ appears, we will actually be able to see Him. We're going to look at verses in Scripture that show that when Christ appears, we will actually be able to see Him. Now, this may come as a shock to some of you at home or maybe even some of you here in the classroom that when Jesus comes back the second time, we will be able to see Him. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, that's to the left from the book of Hebrews. 
So up there on the screen, you see our next graphic, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now, while we are in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, you will want to take note that five times words are used for the sense of sight. Five times word are used, words are used for the sense of sight. So I'm just going to get over there to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and we're going to ask Bill to read this for us. So, Bill, if you could read Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And I'm going to interrupt you. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched. While they did what? While they watched. That's number one. Okay. He, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Out of their what? Sight. Sight. So that's two. Two words already we've seen that to, to describe the sense of sight or being able to see. Keep going there. And while they looked. Stop. While they did what? Looked. They looked. You anticipated that yeah. one very well, didn't you, Bill? And while they looked, so people are looking, that's the third time a word is used for the sense of sight. Keep going. Steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing? Why are you uh, saying what? Gazing. You're very good at this, Bill. <laughs> You're just anticipating the whole thing. Gazing. So that's the fourth word that is used for the sense of of sight. Keep going. Up into heaven, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw. As you did what? Saw. Saw. Him go into heaven. Okay, so notice here. Let there be absolutely no confusion in your mind. Five words in three verses are used to describe the sense of sight or being able to see something. Let's just go ahead and review them very quickly. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, that's one, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight, that's two. And while they looked, that's three, steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven, that's four, this same Jesus, so it's not any other Jesus, this very same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen, that's number five, seen him go into heaven. So make no mistake about it. When Jesus comes back the second time, the Bible tells us that, we, that he is going to appear, Hebrews 9.28, and that we will be able to what? Uh, what is this? See. see him. That's right. We will be able to see him when he comes back. You see the very same thing in the, in the New Testament apocalyptic book or the New Testament book of the Revelation. Let's go to our fifth reference here. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. We'll let Miss Gloria read this. Revelation chapter 1. Go ahead and grab that microphone. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. And let me just go ahead and get there with you. The first chapter of Revelation, the seventh verse, and what does that say? Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. How many eyes? Every eye. And he comes with what? Clouds. The clouds. Okay, keep reading. Even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Now, over there in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, the Bible says that what received Jesus up out of their sight? A cloud received Jesus out of their sight. Here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with what? Clouds. And how many eyes shall see him? Every eye shall see him. So every person that is alive, at the second coming of Jesus, we'll be able to what? See him. See him. Make no mistake, my friend. When Jesus returns, we will be able to see it. He didn't return at some point in the past because we didn't what? See it. So there's no secret coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back to take us home with him and we will be able to see him coming. Now, it's interesting that the Bible says that Jesus left with clouds and he comes back with clouds. 
I don't know how many of you at home are using a New King James Version Bible, but if you are, right now you will want to grab just the King James Version Bible. Because we're going to show you from the King James Version Bible what the clouds are. Do you want to know what the clouds are? You want to know what the clouds are, Tom? This is exciting. This is exciting. Let's go to the old, you see there on your screen, we're going to go to Psalm 104, verse 3. Then we're going to go to Psalm 68, 17. These are just additional references that I have put in my Bible right there above the word cloud in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. That way I know that these verses are going to describe to me what those clouds are that Jesus is going to return in. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So Psalm 104, verse 3. Who in here has the King James Version Bible? Who has the King James Version Bible? All right, Shalita will be able to read that for us. We're going to go to Psalm 104 and verse 3. Psalm 104, verse 3, and I'd like to get there with you. So I'll just keep talking a little bit here. Psalm 104, that's in the Old Testament, to the left of Isaiah. Here we are, I'm there. Psalm 104, verse 3. You want to read that for us, Shalita? Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Okay, so notice there in Psalm 104, verse 3, in the King James Version Bible, it says, Who makes the clouds his chariot. So, just put this mental picture in your mind. Clouds equal what? Chariots. So, what is it? What is it now? You are a math teacher, Mrs. Gloria. Clouds, what? Equal chariots. Now let's go to Psalm 68, verse 17. Psalm 68, verse 17. And Mike, you have King James Version, right? And if you could read that for us, I'd like to be there with you. Psalm 68 and verse 17. Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Hmm. So the Bible says here that the chariots of God are what? Angels. angels. So let's just go back to our equation, math teacher. We had clouds equaling what? Chariots. And now chariots equal angels. So clouds equal angels. When Jesus left in Acts chapter 1, Jesus left in a cloud made up of angels. That is how we can confidently say that those two men that stood by them in white apparel that asked those questions, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. We can say without any hesitancy that those two men that were in white apparel had come out of that cloud that was made up of angels. Those two men were actually angels delivering a message for Jesus. Jesus was leaving his disciples here on this earth. And he evidently left them here for a long time because they're all dead. And their children are dead. And their children are dead, so on and so forth, until you and I are right here. If Jesus' coming was soon then, even more so now. You remember that study that Pastor Sizemore did for us on the signs of the times. Or how to know that the second coming of Jesus is near. Powerful study. Those of you at home, if you haven't seen that, you need to go to comeexperiencelife. Dot com. Just look for the links there on the media page, and then you too will be able to uh, order the, the, DVD, the complete DVD set, or maybe that's what you already have. You'll want to go back to presentation number three, where we talked about signs of the times. But Jesus here is taken up in a cloud. Revelation 1-7 says that Jesus comes back in a cloud, and that cloud is made of angels. My question is, how many angels are going to come with Jesus when he comes back the second time? Okay, now let's just imagine this. You remember what happened in the Garden of Eden. 
Not the Garden of Eden, sorry. You remember what happened were at Jesus' tomb. At Jesus' tomb, one, one gospel says one angel, another gospel says two angels. So at the most, we're talking about two angels that come down. And what happens to all of those Roman soldiers there at the tomb of Jesus? They fell down like dead men. What happened to the earth? There was an earthquake. Two angels come down from heaven, and who knows how fast angels can travel? I have no clue. All I know is that angels can travel very fast, evidently fast enough to break a sound barrier and cause an earthquake. And so here we have these, at most, two angels coming down, and this whole Roman guard just falls over like dead men. And there's an earthquake, and graves are open. What, how many angels is Jesus going to come with, and what is that going to be like? Let's go to our next reference, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. Matthew, so we're turning to the right from where we are in Psalms. We're going to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31. What does it say there? Tom, you want to read that for us? Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Okay, so how many angels are coming with Jesus when He comes? All. All of the angels. You want me to give you a little caveat here? You want another verse that's not in this study that's pretty exciting? You want one? Where are you going to go? We're going to go to Revelation 8.1. That's absolutely right. So keep your finger there in Matthew. But we're going to go to Revelation 8.1. This isn't part of your study here. But go to Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Now you know the Bible tells us, well let me, just, let me just find that for you. In Revelation, so this is just a caveat. So this is just information that's not in your study. In Revelation chapter, let me just find this. Revelation chapter... 8 verse 1 is where we're going to go. But, all right, we'll just go there. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. The Bible says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now the Bible also tells us that there are angels in heaven that are continually saying, Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. And it's not just this monotonous phrase that they continue to say. They, they actually mean what they are proclaiming. And this goes on in heaven 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all of the time. I say 24 hours a day very literally because there's no night there. You know that, right? 24 hours a day. This goes on. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which is and was and is to come. But all of a sudden, there's silence in heaven. Why is there silence in heaven? Nobody's there. They're where? They're coming here because Jesus comes with His glory and He comes with all of the angels. And notice what it says in our next reference, which is Matthew chapter 16, Verse 27. So you noted in the last reference we were there in Matthew 25, 31, that Jesus came with all the holy angels with him, and he came with his own glory. But now notice what it says in Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse 27. Matthew 16, verse 27. We're going to let uh, Jessica read this for us. Matthew 16, verse 27. For I, the Son of Man, will come in the glory of my Father with his angels and will judge all people according to their deeds. So Jesus comes with his glory, he comes with all of the angels, and he comes with the Father's glory. There's no one in heaven at the second coming of Jesus. All of heaven, <clears throat> even now, is interested in the salvation of man. 
And when that glorious event takes place, where Jesus is going to come back and take us home, all of heaven is empty because every being is coming here to take us home. Every being says, Jesus, I want to get on this cloud with you. Never mind, Jesus. I want to be part of the cloud. And I want to carry you back to earth so that you can get all of these people that you have saved. Oh, let me go with you. And Jesus says, we'll get to the trumpet part in a minute. He says, all right, guys, mount up. Going to get my people. Going to get them. And Jesus comes back down here in a cloud, and oh, it's going to be so vivid. Do you realize that Jesus never touches this earth at the second coming? He never does. So if you ever, if you ever, before Jesus literally comes, I mean, there may be this glorious being that comes out of heaven and then starts walking on this earth, but you know it's not Jesus. We're going to get there because Jesus never touches this earth at the second coming. He never does. So we've seen that Jesus comes with His glory. He comes with all of the angels. He comes with His Father's glory. And if two angels caused an earthquake, what do you think is going to happen to this world when all of the angels, traveling faster than the speed of light, it's going to be amazing, isn't it? Can you just imagine that? We can't. We can't even fathom what it's going to be like. For those that are ready for the second coming of Jesus, it's going to be incredible and magnificent. But for those who are not ready, it's going to be a terrifying event. It's going to be an event that we can see. It's going to be an event, an event where all the angels come. It's going to be an event where God the Father comes. It's going to be an event where God the Son comes. It's going to be an event where God the Holy Spirit comes. All of heaven is coming to get us. And you know, the Bible has told us before that Enoch is in heaven. Moses is in heaven. And who else was there? Elijah. Elijah's there. The Bible doesn't tell us that they're back up in heaven waiting. My guess is that they're on that cloud too. <laughs> Don't let me fall. <laughs> oh, isn't that going to be exciting? Jesus is going to come and Jesus is going to take you home. Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to see Jesus coming in the cloud? Let's go to our next reference. Let's go now to Matthew chapter 24, verses 26 and 27. Matthew chapter 24, verses 26 and 27. And we're going to let Roberto read this. Matthew 24, verses 26 and 27. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or, look, he is in the inner room, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So notice what the Bible just told us. By the way, Robert, you need to make sure that, that when you're giving that Bible study and you're reading, you've got to get eye contact. I know you're focusing on the pronunciation, and we praise the Lord for that. But remember, when you're giving a Bible study, you have to maintain eye contact with the people that you're reading to so that you know that they're following along. If they're not following along, then you as the presenter, if you've been looking up, you can say, for as what shines from the east to the west? They'll be like, lightning. So then they're right back there with you. This is just a way to keep your audience there with you while you're giving the study. So notice what he said in verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, what is the command of Jesus? Don't go. My friends, when Jesus comes back the second time, nobody's going to have to tell you he's in the desert. Because when he comes back, how many eyes will see him? Every eye. Every eye. So do not make a decision right now. Do not make a decision. Forget the do not part. Make a decision right now 
not to follow somebody when they say, Jesus is out in this particular place. Jesus is over here. Jesus is over there. No, no, no. Jesus, when he comes back, will be seen by every eye. So if somebody says he's in a secret chamber somewhere, you don't need to go to that secret chamber. You need to go to the Word of God. You don't need to go, what's the next thing it says? He is in the secret chamber, believe it not. He's in the desert, go not forth. Don't go. You want to know why you shouldn't go? Because if you do go, who are you disobeying? Jesus. If we disobey Jesus, are we on safe ground? We are not. So if we disobey Jesus and we go, we will be deceived. We will literally believe that that being in the desert or that being or person in a secret chamber is Jesus. We will believe it because we have rejected the word of the Lord and we have gone to satisfy our curiosity. You know, there's a saying, curiosity did what? Kill the cat. Don't be a cat. Be a human being that trusts in the divine word of God. He said, don't go. You don't go. He said, don't believe it. You don't believe it. And then he follows that up in verse 26. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Have you ever been in a lightning storm? You ever been in one? I remember growing up in Montgomery, Alabama. You know, it's right there where all the tornadoes come through. I remember standing on the front porch, my dad and I and my brother, watching a tornado about three blocks away. And then finally dad saying, all right, we got to go in the house. But there's this lightning flashing, the rain's falling, and we would go in the house into the bathroom that was in the middle of the house. We would shut the door. Mom had taken all her candelabras off the wall, so if something happened, we wouldn't get hit in the head with a candelabra. But even in that room, the door closed. When the lightning would flash, we could see the lightning coming in underneath the door. I could close my eyes in those thunderstorms and still see the lightning. When Jesus says that every one of us will see him come, he literally means we will see him come. Are you ready to see the coming of Jesus? Oh, man, I'm so ready to see the coming of Jesus. There will be some people that are not very happy that Jesus has returned. You know, there will be two types of prayer meeting going on at the second coming of Jesus. Some people will be looking up saying, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him. And some people will look at the rocks and say, Hey, fall on me. This is miserable for me. I pray that you and I are in that first group of people. Let's go to Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 6 and we'll see the Bible describe this. Our next reference, the ninth reference, Revelation chapter 6. We are going to read verses 14 through 17. Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. And we'll go ahead and let Mike read this. Revelation 6, 14 through 17. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. You ever seen an angry lamb? <laughs> The very Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ, is going to come back. And for those of us that are not ready, that glorious second coming is going to be terrifying for us. Notice what it said there in verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. I mean, you imagine, it's not a scroll unrolling. 
It's as if the two ends of heaven are just rolling up. And then we're exposed to all of the elements in that vacuum called outer space. It says there, in every mountain and island were moved out of their places. When Jesus comes on that cloud of angels, the earthquake is not just going to open graves. It's going to disintegrate islands. It's going to flatten mountains. It's going to be an event so magnificent that we can't help but to see it. For some people that see it, they're going to be praying to the rocks there. Isn't that what it says? Verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. It's heavy, isn't it? That there will be people that are not ready for the second coming of Jesus. But you and I can choose to be ready, can't we? Is that the choice you want to make? Is that the choice that you want to make? Would you like to be ready for the second coming of Jesus? Let's keep reading here. So when Jesus comes back in Revelation 6, 14 through 17, do you think it's going to be a quiet thing when the mountains are leveled? Do you think it's going to be a quiet thing when an island disappears? Do you think it's going to be a quiet thing when people are praying for the rocks to fall on them? Absolutely not. We're going to go to Danielle, and Danielle's going to read for us our 10th reference, which is Psalm 50, verse 3. Psalm 50, so we're going to the Old Testament. The Old Testament, Psalm 50, and verse 3. So we're just going all the way back to the Old Testament book of Psalms. We're going to the 50th Psalm, and verse 3. Notice what it says there as she reads. Our God shall come, and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. So when our God comes, it's going to be a very quiet event, isn't it? No, why not, Roberto? Why is it going to be quiet? Because the Bible said it's not going to be quiet. You remember this? We just read it. He says, for when our God shall come, or our God shall come, and shall not keep silence. So not only is it, are rocks going to be falling all over the place, islands disappearing, but God's not even going to be silent when He comes. You know, I'm, I, I'm sure it won't be the old Wild West hoop when they were out there rounding, woo-hoo, rounding up the cattle, but God's going to be saying something when He comes, isn't He? He sure is. He's going to be blowing on a trumpet. And that trumpet's going to be so loud that when that earthquake happens, people are going to pop up out of the graves like, like daisies in your front lawn or something. It's just going to be incredible. When God comes, it's not going to be quiet. It's not going to be something we can't see. When God comes, we will be able to see it. We will be able to hear it. We will even be able to feel it. Go with me now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 17, and 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18. And we're going to ask Bill to read this for us. 1 Thessalonians. Now, 1 Thessalonians is in the T section of your Bibles. So make sure you go to the T section, which is in the New Testament. The T section is in alphabetical order. So as long as you find one of the T's in the New Testament, you can do some deductive reasoning and figure out whether you need to go to the left or the right. So we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With a what? With a shout. With a what? With, <laughs> with a shout. <laughs> with a what, Bill? Come on. With a shout. I don't shout. <laughs> Bill, for heaven's sakes. Will, will, with a what? Shout. Oh, very nice. I thought maybe I was going to have to give that microphone to Tom for a minute there. <laughs> for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. shout. Does that sound quiet? No. Absolutely not. Keep reading. Okay. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. With a what of God? 
A trumpet. The trumpet of God. Have you ever heard a quiet trumpet? No. 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 Have you ever heard... Well, never mind. Just keep going. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That sound... I know I'm interrupting you a lot. You, you forgiving me? Of course. Thank you. The sound of that trumpet, the shout of God, because listen there, it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. So who's going to shout? The Lord. the Lord is. With the voice of the archangel and with the what? Trump of God. Trump of God. So when God descends from heaven, he's coming and he is not going to keep what? Silence. Silence. I feel like I'm preaching now, but I've gotten to a point in this Bible study where I feel like I need to preach. <laughs> preach, he said. The Lord is going to, to descend from heaven. So what's the event? Second coming. That's absolutely right. He descends with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with a trump of God, and the voice of the archangel, the shout, and the, the, uh, the trumpet are so loud that dead people wake up. What dead people wake up at the second coming? The dead in Christ. The dead in Christ. That means, what did you say, Shalita? That means the, the righteous. That's absolutely right. So at the second coming of Jesus, righteous people begin to pop up. Can you just imagine? Oh, my grandma. Her name was Ruby. She has this, had this beautiful ruby red hair, and she's buried in Alabama. Now, Alabama, all they have up there is red clay. So I can imagine when my grandmother comes up out of that grave at the second coming of Jesus, she's going to do this. <laughs> You know, just that waving hair thing flowing and all this red dirt's going to be flying out. She's going to look up and she's going to see Jesus. Amen. And maybe you've lost somebody that's special to you. And you're just waiting, longing to see them again. Maybe you never even thought you would be able to see them again. But through this Life on the Edge series, you've realized that Jesus is a God that can be trusted. He's a God that is going to fulfill His promise to come back to this earth and take us to heaven with Him where you and I will see those of our loved ones who have died in Christ. And where is it, where is it Bill, that we are going to meet Jesus when this happens? In the air. Prove it to me. Okay, I'll keep reading then. What verse are you going to read? <laughs> verse 17. All right, read verse 17. All right, it says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, now remember very seriously, Jesus told us in Matthew that if somebody tells you that he is in a secret chamber, don't believe it. If somebody tells you he's in the desert, don't go there. This is the verse I told you we were going to get to. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. It says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the what? Clouds. clouds. And the clouds are made up of? Angels. angels. How many angels? All. All. You can't count them. I mean, there's a lot of them, that's for sure. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So we will meet Jesus in the cloud that is made up of Amen. angels. So prepare yourself. You know, earlier we were talking and we said, you know, uh, what's going to happen to those people that are afraid of heights at the second coming? Because all of a sudden they're just going to go up to the cloud. Because Jesus isn't going to be on this earth, is he? Not at the second coming. You know what's going to happen to those people that are scared of heights? They ain't going to look down. They're just going to keep their eyes right on Jesus. <laughs> but you're right. They won't be scared of heights anymore. Because they will be with Jesus. Perfect love casts out all fear, doesn't it? So he says there, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus Christ promised us that he would come back. That he was going to go to heaven. He was going to prepare a place for us and then he would come back and he would say, Shalita, he's going to be shouting it. Come on, let's go home. <laughs> Jesus promised that he would come back and take us home. Jesus promised that he would come back and take you home. The only thing that would keep us from being there 
is making a choice to reject our Savior, to reject Jesus, to not allow Him to fulfill His promise in our life. Today, won't you say to Jesus today, I want to be ready. Jesus, I want to be able to look up at you and say, Lo, this is my God. Is that what you want to do? I see Shalita just shaking her head. It's about to fall off. She's so excited. <laughs> Jesus is going to come from heaven with a shout, not quiet. So what we've seen already, Jesus promises to come back. When he comes back, every eye will what? See him. See him. Every ear will hear. hear him. The wicked are going to be praying to the rocks to do what? Fall. Fall on them. The wrath of the Lamb. They can't stand the pure love of Jesus. While the righteous are looking up, Tom, we're going to be there, man. Amen. And, and the Lord's going to have a guitar for us in heaven or something. <laughs> and bro, we're going to be able to hit every note. I mean, it's just going to be incredible. Maybe it'll be a harp. Probably will be a harp. But we won't be disappointed. Amen. Let's go now to our next reference. We've, we, we've had a lot of fun here in Thessalonians, haven't we? Because we're excited about Jesus coming back. And you're excited about Jesus coming back. And when you give this Bible study to people, when you feel that excitement, let it show. Because Jesus is coming back. Now, you don't need to hoot and holler and jump around, but it's exciting to know that Jesus is going to take us home, isn't it? Are you ready for Him to take you home? If not, why not? Our next reference. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. And we will go ahead and let... Um, We'll let Jessica read this for us. 1 Corinthians 15. So we're in Thessalonians. So we're just going to turn to the left in our Bibles. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. We will begin reading in verse 51. But let me tell you a wonderful secret God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in a blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, the Christians who have died will be raised with transport, transformed bodies. And then we who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. For our perishable earthly bodies must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. Isn't that powerful? God says there, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. Changed. Now this Bible study is on the second coming. The next Bible study is on the millennium. The Bible study after that is on the state, the destruction of the wicked. And then the Bible study after that is on what happens when you die. The Bible says here in verse 51, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die. But we shall all be, what's the word? Changed. Changed. There you go, Shalita. If we're scared of heights, are you scared of heights? Are you? If, since we're scared of heights, we're going to be changed. And we're not going to be scared of heights anymore. It says that we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Then it says, at the last trump. At the last what? Trump. This is what links this verse with Thessalonians, just trying to get to the way you turn in your Bibles, to Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised, what? Incorruptible. Incorruptible. You know, my wife and I went walking the other day, and my knee's been bothering me a little bit since then. And uh, you know what's going to happen in the second coming? My knee's not going to bother me. My grandpa went to the doctor one day, and the doctor said, because uh, his knee was hurting, and the doctor said, well, Tom, you're just getting old. And my, my grandpa says, well, let me tell you something. My other knee's just as old as this one, and it don't hurt. When we get to heaven, everything's going to work. We'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, speaking of those that are alive, shall be changed. For this corruptible 
must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This verse right here tells us in the plainest of language that not one man right now has immortality. When is it, Bill, that you and I get immortality? At the second coming. At the second coming. When the Lord shouts, when the voice of the archangel goes out, when the trumpet is blown, when the dead in Christ are raised incorruptible, then you and I get immortality. Are you ready for that? Are you really prepared to live forever? In a place where there's no sin? In a place where there's no suffering? You know, I've often thought, when you fall down in heaven, do, you, do your knees get skinned up? It ain't going to fall. I mean, it's just unimaginable, isn't it? But Jesus is going to come, and He has promised us that. He's going to come back to this earth. He is going to take us off of this earth. He is going to take us up to heaven, and we get to be with the Lord forever. You just remember, my friend. Remember that Jesus will never touch the ground at the second coming. Do not be deceived. God has warned us. Jesus is not going to come in a secret manner as the Bible has shown us today. Jesus is going to come in a manner that can be seen, in a manner that can be heard, in a manner that can even be felt. The question is, are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready to be changed? Are you ready to see your loved ones that have died in Christ. I can't wait to wrap my arms around my nanny, my grandma, my papa, my two cousins, my three cousins. My friends, Jesus is coming back and He's going to take you home. And it's your choice to be ready for Him.